All right, well, maybe we should start because I know Paul, you have a meeting right after this. So welcome everybody to uh, our core competency programming this today. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Paul Neum. Dr. Neum is a professor and the division head for the Division of Dermatology and holds the George F. Odland Endowed Chair in, in Dermatology. And along with his appointments in, in the Department of Medicine, Dr. Neum also holds adjunct appointments in the Department of Departments of Oral Health Sciences and Lab Medicine and Pathology. He's also an affiliate investigator in the Clinical Research Division of the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. And so today, Dr. Neum is going to share an overview of his research program. Go ahead. Dr. Neum, you can start. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Melina. Um, and before I, I'll share my slides in a moment, but then you go, you guys all go poof and I can't see you. Um, so I'll just wave and say, I hope this is interesting. Um, I have not done something like this before. So that was a challenge to put this together. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll thank Krista, Christina there, uh, Lachance and, and Melina for helping me kind of envision what this might be like. But I think there's gonna be plenty of time for questions and I hope that I'm gonna give you a flavor of a really broad array of what we do here at University of Washington from taking care of patients at all levels, education, direct patient care, indirect remote patient care, philanthropy, you know, fundamental research and faculty promotion leadership, all those kinds of things. My job is definitely not boring. So uh, happy to share with you those things and, and you know, I think that some of the main points today are the importance of teamwork. I look at the names here and I see so many people that our team relies on in the extended way through the Department of Medicine and the school and such. Uh, and it's really, uh, it's been a pleasure and it is an ongoing pleasure to work with and, and um, share these challenges with you. So here's um, this, let me see how this looks. You guys let me know. Let's see, I'll swap displays here. What is, does that look okay? Yes, full screen. Yeah, okay, good. Um, and we'll try and make this work. So uh, I'm gonna mostly talk to you today about the research that we do on a rare skin cancer, Merkel cell carcinoma, affecting about 3000 new patients per year in the United States and uh, how we've built that into, you know, kind of a holistic research and clinical care um, enterprise, basically. So again, I want to thank uh, Melina and Krista. This is a picture, if you guys haven't been there, um, here in the background is the UW Tower, and this is on the top of what's now called the Graduate um, Hotel. Uh, it used to be the Deco Hotel at the corner of 45th and uh, Brooklyn uh, in the U District, and they have a really nice um, uh, sort of outdoor happy hour our thing and a bunch of folks got together a couple of weeks ago uh, to celebrate what was a spectacular afternoon. So how did we build a strong program for this disease? You can see John Olerud and Bill Bremner here. Those are the two folks that still remain very, very close and dear to me as, as mentors and bosses and leaders. And uh, those were the guys who, uh, John as um, a division head for Durham at that time in, when I came in 2006 and Bill Bremner as chair of medicine uh, helped me get started here as a, as a young assistant professor. And, uh, you know, how did we build a strong program for this specific disease? And from a variety of metrics, actually our Merkel cell carcinoma program is actually arguably the best in the world. And I can give you some of those metrics in a couple minutes. Um, yeah, it's a rare cancer, so that makes it a little bit easier to do that. But uh, it's been a lot of fun to build. And I would have to say in many ways, it has exceeded kind of our wildest dreams of what we could accomplish. So keeping patient benefit as the North Star is one of the things that I think is just a really good thing to keep in mind. We, of course, have the whole, at UW Medical Center, the whole patients are first concept, and that's the same idea. But uh, I've many times made research and clinical and financial decisions based on this, and it ends up working out when you have patients as the North Star and the impact as the North Star. Uh, it's really, 
it ends up feeling good and, and you accomplish what you really wanted to do. So we have now built what I would call on the research end, a real flywheel of synergies. And I'll tell you what that means, but it's momentum is the bottom line. Taking tools from many zones, philanthropy and, and reputation and, and, and uh, grants and such, and helping it all add to the whole being greater than the sum of the parts and momentum when one part is struggling another part can help it and of course uh teamwork is as i mentioned both a source of great joy um but it's also absolutely essential if you if it if it wasn't essential 10 or 20 or 30 years ago it's completely essential now to really accomplish much of anything so you know how do you build good teams how do you value those people really important skills uh that uh i just are are very important to to put emphasis on in an ongoing way so here's one slide on you know the path that i took um and yeah it was 23 years of training after high school so i grew up not far in olympia washington my dad was the state epidemiologist he dealt with swine flu and what his life would have been like um had he had to deal with COVID, i can't imagine but um so that's where i grew up um the state capital there being close by and then i was an undergrad at, at harvard and then uh, popped back to the West Coast for eight years as an MD PhD student at Stanford, and then did a year of internship at Brigham and Women's Hospital back one of the Harvard affiliated hospitals and then um, really now these are really kind of one hospital MGH where I did my residency in dermatology uh, really across nine hospitals and and then then did a postdoc um, in the Harvard chemistry department that I'll mention very briefly a little bit later um, basic biology and uh, uh, chemical biology and understanding how UV DNA damage works which still remains a very important aspect of our work today so not a sh short path and yes you, you probably i wasn't the quickest i'm sure you could have shaved off maybe five years from that but if you want to do clinical work and research uh you better enjoy the process and i definitely did um but yeah eventually you become an assistant professor and i started here in 2006 an assistant professor and then now do as melina mentioned administration in the form of being a head of dermatology for the past six years and I see patients one day a week at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and those are mostly Merkel cell carcinoma patients. And those things all integrate nicely with the overall goals and such. But my research lab is what, you know, we'll talk about a little bit more today, not so much in gory research detail, but in how did we assemble it and how does it work and, and what, you know, advice would I have for people as they get their uh, programs going? whether they're the, the PI or, or uh, you know, part of the, uh, the, the leadership team. So here's a picture that I took in 1994 when I was a dermatology resident of a funny hard bump above this guy's you know, mouth here on his lip. Um, and I did a biopsy of it because we didn't have any idea what it was. And it turned out to be a Merkel cell carcinoma. And my professor at the time, Harley Haynes, who is a wonderful guy and actually convinced me to go into derm and uh remains a good friend today um said hey paul you know you've seen a case of this rare cancer um why don't you write a chapter on it i have to write a chapter on in in this textbook so um i we put this together and i really thought this was a ginormous waste of time at the time i didn't want to do it I was working on, like I said, DNA damage and the chemistry lab and and this rare cancer seemed like a, a, a something not useful uh, and a distraction. But I couldn't say no to Harley. And it turns out as I started reading the literature, wow, this is a really interesting cancer. It's way more aggressive than other cancers and radiation is really important and the immune system is really important in managing it. So the chapter came out and I thought, all right, that'll be the end of it. But then a really important thing happened and patients started coming from all over the place because there was no expertise in this cancer it it was going up in incidence and there was nobody who was focusing on it basically so patients started coming from all over and that's an important lesson right there when something unexpected happens and the universe tells you all right this little piece of junk that you thought was a waste actually is important 
you really need to listen to that. And maybe it's a fluke and it goes away in a little while. This didn't turn out to be a fluke. And so that that's a lesson, you know, that I learned. And, you know, you just have to have an open mind. I guess the other way to call it is some um, kissing frogs, <laughs> right? Uh, you never know um, what what might come out of something that looks like a frog. So one slide on what is Merkel cell carcinoma. And we have a website and that's another thing. I'm not sure how specifically I'll mention that, but we have 100,000 unique users to this MerkelCell.org website per year. And when we started this 20 years ago, the standard thought would be, oh, let's write a book on, um, on Merkel cell carcinoma. Well, let's just write another book and we'll have it be focused on, on this. There's, and I've got all these books above my desk and they're, they're literally <sighs> collecting dust. And it's trying to find a cure for Merkel cell. Oh, hello. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, so there's about 3,000 patients per year in the US, uh, and that number is increasing much faster than most cancers because it goes up with age uh, strongly. And the recurrence rate is about six times higher than melanoma. People often say, oh, melanoma is the most aggressive skin cancer. Well, Merkel's six times more likely to come back at around almost half of them will come back. And risk factors are in many ways expected, older age, yes, sun exposure, fair skin and immune suppression may or may not be so obvious, but the major thing that's really unusual about this cancer, and this came out about 10 years after I started working on it, um, was a virus that's on our normal skin. Today, if we take a cotton swab and rub your forehead and throw that in a tube and do PCR on it for the Merkel polyomavirus, we'll find Merkel polyomavirus on half of our normal skin. And it's on the it's in the daycare centers on the doorknobs, and so that's been a that was a great puzzle. How can an insanely common virus that causes no problem that we're aware of normally lead to such an aggressive skin cancer? And we now know I'm not going to go through it in detail today, but we now know molecular reasons why that's the case. Basically, super rare multiple genetic events have to happen in the way that the virus integrates into one of our chromosomes that does not normally happen, and then and then leads to this cancer. Uh, and then UV damage without the virus causes about one in five cases. So in, in general, this cancer then can be managed like many others with surgery and radiation initially for a small, um, a small tumor and you verify that it hasn't spread anywhere else with a sentinel lymph node biopsy or proper scans and things. And half of patients should be done with the whole ordeal after some surgery, radiation scans and things. But almost half will have it come back. And here's part of where that dream kind of has been greater than we anticipated. Um, our team here, led by Mac Cheever and many Shalender Bhatia and many folks whose names will be familiar uh, to you, uh, John Thompson, uh, led to two FDA approvals of, of two drugs that have the, the, were the first two drugs ever approved for this cancer and led to a six-fold, not a 60%, not a 6%, but a six-fold increase in the chance of surviving if this cancer spread someplace else. But even with that, less than 50% will persistently benefit for years and we have a lot of work to do. But I'll show you only one real data slide here. And this, this is a fun slide because it encapsulates a bunch of things. So this is about the ability of immune therapy, so-called PD-1 targeted therapy, to give durable responses. So what our argument was to the, to the drug companies eight, 10 years ago, we said Merkel cell carcinoma would be a great disease to study with immune therapy. And they were like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a rare, can we're not gonna do that. It's a rare cancer. Uh, there's never been a positive trial in it. And um, what else did they say? They said the major thing was chemotherapy works. And they were right. In two thirds of cases, chemotherapy would shrink or eliminate any obvious tumors that the patient had. The issue was, and we knew this and we had studied it, that chemotherapy only lasted usually weeks or a couple months after starting uh, starting chemotherapy. So really short-lived and then the cancer would come back and be resistant to all kinds of things. The patient would be sick from chemotherapy and they'd be immune suppressed and very bad things would happen. So this these data then were very gratifying to see finally once uh, these trials got going. 
because they showed what we had hoped, we weren't sure, we had hoped that if you respond to immunotherapy, you would stay in response. So the yellow line is the pembrolizumab anti-PD-1, and you can see all of these patients initially responded to either chemotherapy or pembrolizumab, and by six months even, more than half of the patients had had their cancer recur if they had started chemotherapy. By 12 months, we're in this zone, and by two years, there's a more than tenfold increased chance of surviving. Uh, okay, not randomized, uh, but you don't get small factors affecting, you know, you know, causing uh, drug effects that are this profound. So this led to rapid FDA approval for um, this drug and, and a related drug called Bavencio, and really changed our practice and was incredibly gratifying and, and exciting. So I will now show you, and Melina, you can tell me if this is working okay. Um, and hopefully you guys can hear and see, well, but this is a story all, from one Kennedy, of our thank patients. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my story. I feel very compassionate about this and about all the patients that go through Merkel cell carcinoma. Well, this was about June, 2018. And I had a bump on the side of my face, right by my ear. And it just, it started to grow, really started to grow quite a bit in May. I was doing a lot of traveling at the time. And um, so I made an appointment at the dermatologist. It was about two and a half or three weeks later that I received a phone call. I'm sitting here at work like I am right now. and got the phone call and she said that she had some news that I had Merkel cell carcinoma and it was a rare and aggressive cancer. And I jumped on the internet and looked it up. And the only word I saw was fatal. And I immediately shut down my browser, didn't look at the internet again, called my wife, Fiona, and um, had the discussion. The team did their research, Fiona and her team, and they found that Dr. Neum had published some papers on Merkel cell carcinoma and he was the leading uh, doctor in this particular field. And we knew that that was right away, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance was the place to go. Our girls, our daughters, Grace and Olivia were 13 and 10 at the time. So we told them that we were going on vacation and one of Fiona's friends came up and stayed with the girls. Through the radiation period, Dr. Liu was my doctor at Queens Hospital. He did the radiation. You know, so then it looked like I had bad sunburn sometimes. The staff would go, oh, you've been out in the sun too long. And I lost hair all the way around. It's grown back some, but they thought I had a very cool haircut. So I was able to pull it off. And guess what? The radiation ended the day before Fiona and I flew out to go on our Mediterranean cruise. So we got to go on the cruise. We flew back to Seattle in October after, after the cruise. And now it was the time to do the scans, find out where, where we were in the process. And we had the scan and we had a positive result. We, uh, the tumor, no tumors were showing up, but Coley said to me, there's a spot that we're not sure of that they read. So once you come back in another two months and we'll take a look at your scan in two months, went to SSCA, got the scan. And, uh, when I bet went back in to meet with Coley, she's like, I could read her face something wasn't right. And the cancer had metastasized the tumor to my liver. I remember Dr. Name, I was in, in the waiting room and he patted me on the shoulder and I he felt like, dang, so, you know, I'm sorry about that. But he also encouraged that we have other avenues to treat this. And at that time, you know, he, he always kept it like, okay, well, we're going to do the next thing. And then, um, says, we're going to move you over to the oncologist, Dr. Kelly Paulson. My insurance, HMSA, which is part of, I think, Blue Shield, Blue Cross Blue Shield group here in Hawaii. Um, she called them up to get me a Keytruda treatment, and they denied it. If you know Kelly, though, she's a fighter. She's a real fighter. This was December 23rd. She told me they denied it. On Christmas Eve, she literally fought through the end of the night with the heads of HMSA. There's a three-hour 
time difference. And she convinced them to approve it. And she did. So what followed was a flew back to Seattle, started my Keytruda infusions. Fiona and I went back three weeks after that to get the infusion, but also at that time to get a scan to see where things stood. And we we're in the waiting room and obviously extremely nervous. And she came in the door with the biggest smile that Kelly, Dr. Kelly Paulson can have. And she says, it's gone. And we just kind of hugged and started crying and everything like that. So that was, that was a miracle. That was a day I'm like, yes. We, of course, called Dr. Neam and Coley at, right then. And they're yelling and screaming and celebrating, et cetera, because it worked. Here I am, two and a half years later. Now I get the infusions every six weeks. I get the scans every four months instead of three months and it's remained gone. And it's, it's Fiona and I bless every single day. We really do. Absolutely. The largest obstacle is when that tumor showed up on the liver. I mean, that was just a moment. That was a very tough moment. And as I said, my, my advice is just to believe in the journey. And I read a quote recently, life is never about what we achieve. It's about what we overcome. I want to give all my love and aloha to all the Merkel cell patients out there. I want to thank all the team members that helped me. And like I said, I've gotten to this point and it's the best time of my life. And I appreciate all of you. God bless. And aloha. All right. So obviously Dave was there in Florida and we have a good chunk of Florida patients. Sorry, he was in um, Hawaii, but we have, we have more patients from Florida than, <laughs> than Seattle. So uh, patients do come from all over the place and that's really a point of uh, pride for our extended team. So our lab is, I think you all know, uh, the South Lake Union campus and we're in the original Brotman building right here on the second floor. And it's been a lovely place to carry out the work close to Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, just a couple blocks away for samples and things going back and forth. Here is um, a bit about our, our research team. We have a few salient things to point out. The first thing you might notice is these little pie charts. And we did this recently. Uh, we have wonderful relationships with our advancement team and with our patients. And yeah, I'm a cheerleader. I'm a fundraiser and a coach. Uh, this is the extent of fundraising. Um, you know, my salary, many people's salaries, Krista's more than half um, from donations. Other people get covered fully by grants and things. It depends on time um, and what we have in terms of resources. But uh, the philanthropy has been a really big deal to us, and we also make great use of undergrad students, and I think that's an important thing for everybody here to know. If you don't partner with undergrads, it's really something to consider. They do need care and feeding, um, uh, but they're real bright, and they are excited for all kinds of experiences. We've hired them to do financial spreadsheet work. We've hired them, of course, to do wet work. Mostly what we have them do is follow our 800 live patients with this cancer, and every year we do a significant update of our database and we're tracking 200 variables on each patient. And so they're, they're saying, you know, has the cancer come back or not? And what kind of treatment did you have and such? So that turns out to be a super powerful thing. And this is wonderful prep for them as they many times will head to uh, graduate school or medical school or nursing school and such. And they're really, really well prepared for that. And of course, we have MD, PhD students and um, grad students from multiple programs and postdocs and it's a very diverse uh, group that's, one of the great joys is people at all levels of, of their sophistication and they can help each other with their board score, with their board exam prep and how to, the, with the next career phase and such. So it's a really nice synergistic relationship there. 
a few high level things about what I'm trying to do and, you know, life purpose and goals. Why are you here? What do you want to accomplish? Well, if I had to put it in a few words, create a powerful team to lay down the foundations for lasting excellence in dermatology at UW and in Merkel cell carcinoma research with a focus on impact for patients being, again, our North Star. And I'll in a moment now tell you a little bit more about this flywheel and some of the components that I think are important in it. It helps us make lots of decisions and helps us support things when when a component is struggling uh, and definitely is related to the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. So a flywheel, you may or may not be familiar with the concept, but older motors and machines used to have them in order to keep the momentum going. And they literally took the angular momentum from a heavy wheel. And if the motor was jugging ahead, you know, jumping ahead, then, then the flywheel would slow it a little bit. And if the pistons were having a hard time, then the flywheel would keep it moving. We don't really have flywheels now, but I like this concept that Jeff Bezos talks about, and you may or may not love Amazon, but one thing you can say is Amazon is friendly to the customer. And that was Jeff's vision is it's all about making the customer experience be positive. And so we're putting patients in the center and uh, scientific progress and some of the components that we're using to generate the momentum in our flywheel include grant support. We have a program project grant that's $14 million and uh, smaller foundation grants and lots of industry collaborations we work with all of you to make sure that those are all free of inappropriate conflict of interest and the conflicts are all managed very carefully philanthropy again that website that we made 20 years ago that was a very unconventional thing to do then and it didn't fit on us on a curriculum vitae as a normal thing to do at all compared to writing a textbook or something like that but one thing that was clear for Merkel was when the biopsy result came back from something that everybody thought was a cyst or something benign, the doctor and the team had no idea what the hell to do with Merkel cell carcinoma diagnosis. It was a complete surprise. And what did they do even 20 years ago? They would Google it. And then we wanted and had a website that would come up at the top and give them good quality information in a patient friendly way that could help and maybe, maybe selfishly then there was a little do you want to donate kind of thing on the side and we have gotten huge numbers of donations often from patients that we haven't taken direct care of but the website and the information benefited them and so yeah the donation and philanthropy is has been a very important part of what we're doing so patient involvement, blood tissue, and advice, uh, really, they would often tell us, this is what you guys need to work on. This is what we need. They would give us blood and tissue. And again, we were working on this before the virus was discovered and certainly before we knew how important the immune system was in fighting this cancer. So those specimens have been precious. We created an official repository of data and specimens. Here's a, a cute little side point. The NIH will not fund you to create a repository of data and specimens. They just will not. That's something that they have been down that road many times. They will not do that. On the other hand, if you do that with philanthropic money and you create it and you say, hey, we have this resource, they will love it. And it will greatly improve your ability to get a competitive grant. So that's very much what we did. And actually, now that we have a program project grant, as you may know, those actually pay administration costs and they also pay the cost of like a core facility. So, you know, we actually can get that paid for directly by the NH. But early on, we had to find creative monies and this was definitely labor of love activity. And you really need some of that. It, it can't all be for short term benefit. That's not the way to think about building something substantial. So education resources, we made that website I mentioned. We have an annual event with over 300 Merkel cell carcinoma patients that fly in um, across from across the country. That, of course, has been virtualized for the last two years, and it works. We have even more people involved um, by Zoom, although the food is not nearly as good. 
Excellent trainees. Uh, again, I mentioned the undergrads, which is a very magical thing about this campus. I was at Harvard for years and great undergrads at Harvard, not gonna argue about that, but they have 10,000 literally labs and PIs that they get to choose from across the Boston area. Here in Seattle, we're a little bit flipped. And the students, as you may know, are always looking very often talented students are looking for opportunities. So I think that's a wonderful way to help them and help us uh, develop together. And it's great fun to you know have this young blood and young energy around. But as I say, you take some care and feeding. So it's gotta be kind of up your, up your alley in terms of enjoying that, but that works really well. And of course we have all the standard kind of levels of trainees uh through postdocs and and assistant professors and those trainees definitely number over a hundred at this point who have gone on to do all kinds of interesting things very rarely sticking with merkel but going on and using some of the tricks and tools that they've learned in diverse ways we have of course phenomenal support and administrative staff and a really active multidisciplinary clinical care team where every thursday at lunchtime we have radiation oncology surgery dermatology, medical oncology, radiology, diagnostic radiology, big time, all get around. And then we invite special people like cardiac oncologists, very rare kind of involvement and ophthalmology when we need them uh, to join and give patients really the best possible high level management that we can with multidisciplinary care. And then of course, very important to mention, not going to be a surprise to any of you, that trust, integrity, and teamwork are essential in having retaining good people and having good esprit de corps and function. So those are the components of the flywheel. So a few little specific comments here. I, I did spend five and a half years as a postdoc. Again, that, that's probably if you want to be faster about this than that. <laughs> That was not the quickest, but I did end that with a bunch of funding and a bunch of momentum and such, and uh, it was a protected time, which is very nice. So a few concepts that I got from my, my time as a postdoc there is to have a BHAG. If you don't know what that is, it's a big, hairy, audacious goal. And that's what you need to get you up and get excited for you in the morning. But even more important, that's what you need to get a potential donor or patient excited about what you're doing. You can't just say, yeah, we're gonna take good care of you and we're gonna use the cookbook to do it. You need to say, we're rewriting the cookbook. The cookbook sucks. The cookbook does not deal with the problem you're having and this is what we're doing to make better tools to help you. And there's your BHAG and patients really like that and will seek you out then to support that. You don't have to be pestering them for money they want to help you do something important. So be resilient and manage your shortcomings. As a postdoc, I was very down on myself because I was not a person who could read a hundred papers and remember all these details and integrate them. And I was surrounded by people that could do that. So I realized in a way I was kind of kind of dumb, kind of in a way, and kind of needed things to be idiotized. So yeah, Melina, gets to see this all the time kaching idiotize it <laughs> so uh we got we got this thing keep it simple and that's really important not over simple but don't tell don't use jargon to tell people more than they need to know use exciting descriptors that are clear to tell them what they need to know in order for them to understand where the field needs to go and so that's an important lesson. So form strategic and sincere partnerships. Many These days, you cannot do everything. The rate at which astronomical new technologies of single cell epigenetic and genetic <laughs> data come through is absolutely mind boggling. So you, you really need to partner with people to have things work well. And then self-care is not selfish probably you all know this but probably you all struggle with it sometimes and this is something that definitely my mom has told me many times you're no good to other people if you're not well and so you can't work yourself to the point of being dysfunctional so you got to take time off you got to get perspective and you got to experience joy in life and then that actually makes you better at your job and so these are this is important and i saw these things 
some of these, especially the self-care thing being very ignored at many phases of my life. And this was definitely a, a phase in which um, that was often thought to be for wimps and uh, that is wrong. So Albert Einstein, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. So wrap your brain around that, but it's not all about what you can write down on your, on your resume and your CV. Creating an environment where people are highly productive, happy, and synergistically integrated and making a difference. That's where we have the most fun and we get to this zone of highest productivity and, and partnership uh, and, and enjoying the successes and commiserating in the sadnesses. And that's, you know, what human beings, that's what makes human beings the happiest. It's not the exact dollar amount that's in your bank account. It's, it's uh, who you get to celebrate fun things with and, and, and struggle through challenges with. I'm really pleased with where our research team has found itself now in terms of a synergistic productive environment. Uh, we have goals um, to reproduce that for the broader dermatology division. We have a need to grow. You may know that derm consults are a disaster. I mean, not consults, appointments for derm are very, very problematically long and we must increase our capacity and we're working hard to do that and grow the whole division uh, and our dermatology program significantly. So day in the life, here's uh, not surprisingly lots of Zoom. There's there's our lab team. We've got clinic teams. We've got, um, you, you know, you know that goal, you know that deal, but lots of meetings with mentees and collaborators. Uh, I don't do wet work in the lab anymore, but enjoy giving sort of higher level guidance on projects and foster relationships with patients, faculty, and stakeholders. There's no two ways about it. Eventually, you can get more done by leading than by, um, you know, doing everything uh, yourself. That's, of course, impossible, really, from a pretty early point. Outside of work, um, uh, I have a pandemic puppy. Um, actually, I don't have pictures of him, but he's a lot of fun. And then music's always been an important part of my life. There's a, those are my two boys a couple of years ago. Um, they both play the violin and the older ones keeping the bow straight on the younger one. And uh, that's that's a fun thing. And uh, my brother and, and my mom there, uh, fortunately, all live within an hour of here. And that was a big reason for um, our family to come back uh, to Washington State. So a couple little things to leave you with in terms of where our Merkel research is going. We're very excited about a reducing the chance that Merkel will recur. I told you there's 40% overall, and some patients have a 70%, 80% chance their cancer will come back. And right now there is nothing approved to minimize that chance. So two of the things, um, Shalender Bhatia and we are leading a so-called adjuvant immunotherapy. Adjuvant, as you may know, is a drug you give to somebody in whom you cannot detect cancer right now, but you know that they are at risk for having their cancer come back. So adjuvant immunotherapy is one uh, approach and then a therapeutic vaccine that we would give to patients who had had this cancer so that their immune system can recognize and get rid of the virus and the, the virus that's hiding in the cancer cells and thus get rid of the cancer. Uh, we want to help patients that don't respond to immunotherapy. That is a huge goal. We have many patients who are not as lucky as Dave Kennedy, who gave his story there. And, you know, we don't know. Some of the patients who go like Dave did two and a half years without their cancer have it come back then another year or two later. So there's a lot to do there. And we're very excited about multiple approaches to help those patients that are entering clinical trials and develop the next generation of Merkel cell carcinoma experts, both within and beyond um, UW, we really try and help support programs around the world uh, so that they can help the patients in their neighborhood uh, more effectively. So there's um, one of those Merkel celebration events from a couple of years ago. This is right before the pandemic, and uh, we still appreciate looking at when we were able to get together as a large group. But I will now stop the screen share, I think, if I can figure out. There we go. And uh, happy to take any questions. Melina, I don't know if you've seen any or. No, I haven't seen any. You guys can either pop it into the chat or unmute and ask a question if you like of Dr. Neum.
I don't, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us. It's really, really helpful to see the whole picture. And we're, you know, we're working on little pieces and um, don't always get to participate in that. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're really, you're welcome, Kelly. And wh while we're waiting in case anybody else has anything, here's another amusing observation that I think you guys will <laughs> maybe find a little surprising, but as a professor, you know, as a faculty member, sometimes you think, gosh, there's a lot of rules around here or anywhere. Um, and it's interesting, since I've taken on more of a leadership role, I can see why those rules exist. And maybe that's not a surprise to you all. You, you know you're often in enforcing rules for everybody's best interest, even though they seem in the short term to be kind of like a pain. But I've seen now why those rules exist and why things go off the guard, you know, beyond the road, off the guardrails, if, if those rules don't exist. And more than that, perhaps, and so maybe that just can make you feel a little better. Sometimes it's where I also have to enforce the rules these days and that gets sort of tiresome, but they're really there for a reason. Sometimes we have to bend them because the reason just doesn't make sense in that, in that situation. But the other thing that's surprising me and this group is the perfect example of that is there's a matrix out there. And when something goes wrong, there's somebody there to help you. You know, Walt, you may be in the background most of the time, but when something goes really wrong, you're there to help fix in that zone. We have people for emergency HR problems. And many times I felt sort of saved by this web that I didn't even really know existed. And so you're often part of that, maybe not seen when there isn't a problem, but I wanted to say thank you because I'm now six years into this. I'm sort of a, I'm sort of, you know, relatively experienced, but as people come in, they will be caught by that web, that safety web, and it's really important. And it's not always so sexy, uh, but when things go bad for anybody's fault or not, it's really important that that exists. And I thought you might appreciate hearing that. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Neem, for spending time giving your overview of your research. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, except just thanks very much for your presentation. Great presentation. And yeah, my pleasure. All... Thank you all for your hard work. That is, I think my point here is not always sufficiently loudly sung, but uh, thank you. Enjoy your 15 minutes back. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay.